Well, thanks to Paula and Michelle for uh, inviting me down here. It's my pleasure to present to you uh, a synth synthetic biology-based method that's very powerful. It's known as structural DNA nanotechnology. In my laboratory at Harvard, we harness DNA as a molecular Lego brick in order to build microscopic drug-laden containers that we want to use to fight cancer. To give you a feeling about the length scales invo involved, imagine a person's body uh, expanded such that when she lies down, it extends halfway from New York to Boston. And imagine that we're trying to attack a tumor that's now in this metaphor the size of a football stadium built up from cells that are about one yard in diameter. So within this metaphor, we're trying to attack those cells by delivering thimble-sized packets of drugs, and we're weaving those thimbles with strands of DNA that are the width of human hairs. Now, for both synthetic biology and for natural biology, shape is inter really integrally mixed with function. In order to fulfill the potential of synthetic biology, we really need to learn how to control shape on these very smallest scales. So an example on the upper left is an artistic rendition of the ribosome. It's a, it's a uh, cell's uh, protein printer. It prints proteins, and it's about 25 nanometers in diameter. It's considered to be a pretty large macromolecular complex, if you ask most biologists. And because of its shape, it's able to decode information in a messenger RNA tape into a sequence of amino acids to build proteins. The example on the lower left is a T4 bacteriophage. It's a virus that infects bacteria. It looks like a microscopic lunar lander that docks onto the bacterial host surface and then injects its DNA cargo through a hypodermic syringe-like neck into that cell. This one's about 100 nanometers in diameter. And we can see on the right are the uh, flagella of Chlamydomonas that or even larger. That scale bar you can see is 200 nanometers. So biology definitely uses very intricate structures across a wide range of length scales. When I was an undergraduate uh, back in the 1990s, I, I was wondering, now how is it that we could design objects of this kind of size and complexity? But it seemed like the prospects were so far away, and I had no idea how we'd be able to get there within my lifetime. Well, now. Uh, it turns out I'm going to show you a method that seems to be up to the task. You might be surprised to learn how far we've gotten. And it's thanks largely to a scientist named Ned Seaman here at NYU. He's the founder of the field of structural DNA nanotechnology. We're all familiar with the role of DNA in coding for proteins or, and for uh, basically encoding our hereditary information. But Ned's key brilliant insight was that we could uh, use DNA as the direct building material for molecular machines. So the, the key property that makes DNA special is that we can very reliably, re reliably program strands to come together based on complementary shapes, or in this case, complementary sequences. So as long as you line up two strands and all the A's are matching up with T's on the other strand and all the C's are matching up with G's on the other strand, then you'll get a good mix. And if there are any mismatches, then that interaction will be greatly destabilized. So Ned realized that we can not only use this to put together linear pieces of DNA, but we can actually create branched structures. So in the example on the lower right-hand side, if we chemically synthesize four strands of DNA, each with different sequences, such that, for example, domain A1 is complementary with domain D2, D1 complementary with C2, and so on and so forth, we can very reliably program these strands to self-assemble into these branch structures and then hierarchically assemble those guys into large two-dimensional or three-dimensional networks approximating any kind of shape that we want. The specific flavor of DNA nanotechnology that uh, we like the most is called DNA origami. It was developed by uh, Paul Rodeman at Caltech in 2006. And in this method, you start from the 7,000 base genome of the M13 bacteriophage. We know its sequence, and based on that known sequence, we chemically synthesize hundreds of short strands that are 20 to 50 bases long that are programmed by that base complementarity to pinch the long strand into a kind of anti-parallel array of loops after heating the sample up to a high, high temperature and cooling down to room temperature over the course of an hour. And at the end of this annealing process, you end up with a structure that looks like a log raft or one of those mats that you use to roll up maki sushi made out of DNA. And it's held together by strands crossing over. So for example, if I'm, I'm just going to step away from the podium here, I've got my laser pointer. If 
But if you imagine the yellow strand here starts from the bottom and it carries part of the gray, and then now it's doing a molecular square dance and switching partners to a distinct first part of that gray, and that way drawing those two parts of the gray close together. So that's DNA origami. So Paul Rudiman used this method to build structures such as this disk with three holes. So it's about 100 nanometers in diameter, if you remember um, what that means. This example in the upper left-hand corner represents just part of the upper lip. So it's about twice the mass of a ribosome that I showed you earlier. It's like we have two ribosomes worth of molecular silly putty that we can mash by self-assembly into almost any shape that we want. And because it's self-assembly, we can make trillions and trillions of copies at the same time. So when Paul did this, his advisor, Eric Winfrey, proudly proclaimed that this is the most concentrated form, form of happiness ever created in the history of humanity. Um, so my lab is really, uh, we, when I saw this, I was amazed. Uh, so all, all of these things came to a surprise to a lot of us scientists that this should be possible. And my lab helped to expand this into three dimensions. I don't, I'm not really going to talk about that, but I do want to share one thing that we did that I think this audience will appreciate. So these are floating compressions from Ken Snelson, where you have beams that are bearing compression, and then they're connected by cables bearing tension. Uh, here's the particular version that's uh, down by the World Trade Center. And we collaborated with Don Ingber at the Wies Institute in order to implement this with DNA origami. And I'm not going to go through the details, but basically we have staple strands that are pinching together different parts of that long, long scaffold strand, such that each of the three struts has three separate sections coming together. And in that way, you can build up one of these tensegrity prisms. And so on the next slide, we can see here actual experimental images using the electron microscope of both tensegrity kites with just two struts and tensegrity prisms. So it turns out we think that these actually could be useful for therapeutic purposes, such as wound healing, in addition to just looking really cool. Um, so one of the things that we're really trying to do in terms of, of utility is to develop containers to deliver drugs to cancer cells. So here's a metaphor of, 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 of having some kind of therapeutic where we have something that looks like a pill. The, the upper surface is supposed to represent the outside of the cell on the bottom, the inside of the cell, and in black is supposed to represent the cell's attempt to engulf part of the outside. So it's going to take up these, these uh, drug containers into the cell. Um, and we decided to take this metaphor a little bit more literally with DNA origami and build something that really does look like a pill. At least to us, it looks like a pill. So in this case, we have a, a, a architecture of four separate domains that we assemble separately, or trillions of copies of them. And then in the second step, we're hierarchically linking them up using those base complementarity rules. We can, of course, change the properties. We can change the diameter. We can change the number of components. So on the, uh, uh, here we see something that's 60 nanometers wide and 120 nanometers long. And then we made another one that has uh, four of those central domains. So it's 180 nanometers long. And I'd like to point out here that the main motivation for us to make these rounded caps was actually not utility. The main purpose was to inspire and inform other scientists, members of the press, lay people, that hopefully when you look at this, it's not a stretch to think, oh, it looks like a pill. Maybe they're trying to use it as a pill. So uh, just because you can't see something with the naked eye doesn't mean design's not important. Doesn't mean you, you don't want to make it look good, because we can see this with electron microscopes. It's a very important principle for synthetic biology is to make things look good with design. So I've been telling you about a method that is kind of akin to the magic snake. We have this long thing that we're somehow forcing into some three-dimensional shape, and we can create some quite intricate three-dimensional shapes. But um, at the end of the day, we might wish that we had something that the, the Danes invented that might be a little bit more modular, uh, easier to self-assemble into these things. And so my colleague Peng Yin at the Beast Institute took this, took this quite literally again, and then he decided to discard with this long strand and did something that really surprised us, which is that he, he treated short pieces of DNA as these little U-shaped bricks. So if you imagine a pipe cleaner that's folded into a U-shape. And then the design rule was that he was using this sequence complementarity so that each one of the U-shapes would have four nearest neighbors. So if you think of four different domains that you could wrap around each of those horseshoes. And if you do it in this planar arrangement, you could imagine tiling a two-dimensional surface as shown on the upper left-hand side if you, if you had bricks that came together in this way. And the amazing thing was that this worked. And then uh, we collaborated with, with his group to extend this to three dimensions. And the basic way that you do that is you change the design rules a little bit. I don't have time to go into the details, such that now those little U-shaped pipe cleaner structures fit at a 90 degree angle. And again, this is in a sequence specific fashion. 
And if you do that, you can now tile three-dimensional space. So if we imagine the following thought experiment, that in our CAD program, we designed a bunch of these U-shaped DNA pipe cleaners into, let's say, five different planes, where they're arranged in a different orientation in each plane, but rotated 90 degrees. And they're only being held together by the power of thought at this point. And then we're programming the sequences to be complementary, so all those plugs will fit just right into all the holes. And then now, once that, once that occurs, then now you have a structure that is held together by reality, not just thought. Um, and the amazing thing is that not only does the idea make sense, but when you throw these things into a test tube, it really works. So again, a lot of us were really surprised. Uh, furthermore, I think this has an immediate analogy to something like design or 3D printing additive manufacturing, where we can imagine uh, abstracting this to a voxel space, volume element space, where now each one of those little volume elements has dimensions of two and a half by two and a half by two and a half nanometers. So we can basically pluck away the ones we don't want, keep the ones we want, and then we have a computer program that compiles that into the se uh, series of bricks that we're either going to include in our self-assembly or leave out. Because anywhere we leave out a brick, then we're just going to get a hole. So again, these are all se specific sequences. Every sequence has a different address within the 3D volume, and whenever we leave out specific sequences, we get a hole. So we went ahead and um, pipetted these strands over and over and over again. Actually, we had a pipetting robot that, that did it, made, made things a little bit easier. So on the lower left-hand corner, you can see we're, that's if we, if we add all the strands together, we get this cube that's 30 nanometers per dimension. But then if we do it again and we leave out some strands, then we're going to get interesting shapes. So you can see here, uh, for example, Roman, uh, Roman letter, uh, the um, Latin, Latin alphabet in 3D. We can see inscriptions of Chinese characters, for those of you who can read Chinese. Uh, the middle lane is what's supposed to represent, the solid now represents the things we left out. So actually cavities that are completely enclosed by the DNA. And then on the uh, lower left, we can see something here, it's a little spaceship, because who doesn't <laughs> like spaceships? Um, so that's just a model, but then Here's the actual experimental result. These are, again, transmission ele electron micrographs, projection images that we're experimentally collecting. Um, you can look at these, but I just want to point out again, spaceship. <laughs> and then uh, I have a movie that maybe we can play um, during the discussion to d distract you guys. But thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>